Well, good afternoon. Uh, good morning to those out west. My name is Jeff Strong, and I'm your Master of Ceremonies and host today. I'd like to introduce our speaker, who is Garth Mahelchen. And just a full disclosure here, Garth is a good friend of mine. We both live in uh, beautiful Cowichan Valley in, on Vancouver Island in BC, and we meet once a week for coffee or lunch. Now, Garth has a um, BSc and a Master of um, Business Administration. He's a musician, a consultant, healthcare professional, and project manager. He's held management positions in healthcare and and uh, telecom. His thinking was kindled as an emergency department crisis counselor, where he witnessed how the quality of people's thinking and judgment impacted the quality of their lives. As residents of the Anthropocene, we live in times of unprecedented novelty, ambiguity, and uncertainty. And as never before, the quality of our lives depends upon the quality of our thinking our judgment and problem solving skills. Our rules of thumb, our formal guidelines, our decision making frameworks, expert tricks of the trade, trade, and snippets of advice up to the challenge. How can we improve our reasoning in the face of our existential challenges? And this talk today centers on how we can think more critically about what can sabotage our best judgment and threaten the survival of countless uh, future generations, especially when we're talking about climate change. So the presentation will be followed, as Art has said, by a conversation with questions please put into the chat and observations from the participants, that is you people. So Garth, I'm, the floor is now yours. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jeff, and thanks uh, everyone for setting this up. I'm uh, delighted to be here. I actually can't see my face now, but that's probably better. Uh, as I said, though, I'm delighted to speak with this group because I know you're all very accomplished thinkers within uh, your domains of expertise. And uh, I guess if you're Seinfeld fans, I could say that you're masters of your own domain. <laughs> anyway. This, this is a very different talk. I would normally not give such a talk, first of all, over Zoom, because any talking about thinking is highly interactive. Uh, but nevertheless, we'll try to do our best, and I'll just try to wing it through this material, and uh, we'll have a, a bit of a little adventure thinking about our own thinking. Oh, why? There we go. Okay, so uh, this is precisely what I'm going to talk about here. Uh, the Anthropocene. How do we how do we think about this? How do we think about it such that it increases our chances of survival and uh, thriving? So the uh, structure of this talk is pretty basic. Uh, I'll give the introduction and a few definitions. Then I'll talk about the cognitive challenges, uh, the reasoning challenges that the Anthropocene throws at us. Uh, then we'll start uh, getting into the meat of some common thinking problems. And uh, I've just uh, pulled a few things out of the uh, immense uh, landscape of, of information and commentary about thinking and, uh, and thrown a few things together that I think, in, in my best judgment, are, uh, represent a good introduction to this uh, incredibly diverse topic. And then finally, I, uh, well, thanks to Art, he suggested I put a little bit more about critical thinking in here. So I will actually show you the, the core concepts from a very good critical thinking uh, framework uh, that was uh, constructed by the Foundation for Critical Thinking in California. And anytime you see the little light bulb here, you will know that that is a thinking tip. So take note of that, folks. Uh, so let's get started right away. I've got a lot of material, so I'll whiz through things pretty quickly here. But OK, what's the purpose of this? Well, I just, first of all, I want to impress upon you, it, not as if you really need to be reminded, but I want us to immer uh, immerse ourselves in the incredible cognitive challenges that the Anthropocene, this geological age of mankind, presents to us. 
I also want to invite you to think about your own thinking to improve your thinking using some common reasoning tools and frameworks. Uh, I also want to offer some cognitive tools that may, may allow you to stand up to those intellectual bullies. So you can say, look them in the eye and say to them, the emperor has no argument. And uh, also I'd like to inspire uh, in all of you a lifelong love of doing philosophy. And as I like to put it, scavenging for wisdom. Uh, I take that phrase from a wonderful book uh, by Eric Weiner called The Socrates Express, as you see at the bottom there. A, a wonderful, wonderful uh, book of applied philosophy that's a lot of fun. Okay, now as the flaming dumpster makes its way uh, down the water course, let's get started. Okay. Right off the bat, I admit this is an impossibly broad subject. Uh, it, it's, it, it, you know, it's impossible to uh, put a circle around any academic discipline uh, in terms of who would be the main source of information about thinking, my goodness. Look at all the different disciplines that have a lot to say about thinking these days. We've made tremendous progress in the cognitive neurosciences, psychology, philosophy, artificial intelligence, behavioral economics, so sociology, psychiatry. And every time I've been to uh, an international conference on critical thinking uh, down in California, uh, faculty members mentioned to me, there's always this battle between faculties, who should own critical thinking, who should be responsible for it, uh, for the pe pedagogy and its delivery. Well, uh, so why am I qualified to give this uh, talk? Well, I'm not, of course, you know, I, uh, who isn't really qualified to talk about thinking? Everyone and no one, but I, I'm, uh, I really uh, should evince real humility as opposed to Albert Einstein when I say I have no special talent. I'm only passionately curious. And uh, of course, CD bars and emergency departments are perfect habitats for watching human brains in action, unplugged and un unfiltered. <laughs> okay, well, have you ever heard this before? Stay in your own lane. Who are you to tackle such an impossibly broad subject? Uh, to which I always answer, me? I don't know, who am I? <laughs> Speaking of proto-minds, I've thrown in a few interesting pictures that are uh, from an artificial intelligence program that employs uh, machine learning to analyze billions, literally billions of images and their keywords. So you can plug in any text string and it'll punch out some kind of an interesting photo. and. It's really interesting. We're really looking at a proto mind here. I asked in this, uh, uh, the text string I use is man searching for identity in a dystopian future in the style of Van Gogh. Can you imagine what it did? You know, it's just remarkable. We live in utterly remarkable times. Okay, welcome to the Anthropocene, another impossibly broad subject, because we're embedded in it, of course. My question is, how are we actually thinking about this? You take a look at that graph of population. And if, if, you, if you take a look at any graph of human activity in enterprise, you can go along, well, you can start at the beginning of our species 300,000 years ago, and you'll see a flat line into, until you pretty much hit my birthday, 1954. I, the Anthropocene has essentially happened in my lifetime, and this is extraordinary. Here's another uh, graph here from Wikipedia. This is just a, a, a depiction of the change in activity uh, in uh, human culture. Uh, and you can see that where I was born, and I had no idea that by the time I got to be 68 years old, the world would look like this. Oh my goodness. This is utterly beyond any experience we've ever had in the entire evolution of our species. This is a view of a, a utopian future, but I thought I'd show you this. If uh, This is from DALI, the artificial intelligence program. 
as you can see, there are actually some biases built into this proto mine of artificial intelligence, because whenever I ask for a utopia, it would show me scenes where in close inspection, something is really wrong here. Buildings are falling apart, things aren't working. So pretty interesting that uh, humanity seems to have a bias towards uh, dystopia. And these are even more frightening. Uh, I, I like the little uh, fellow with his giving a finger to the, uh, to the nuclear blast, apparently. That, that is very creative. I, how, did, how did it come up with this? Anyway, one of the biggest problems we have with the Anthropocene now is the very way we think in the society, the way we reason. I, uh, I liken it to uh, looking at the world through a lot of straws, high resolution straws, but perhaps each of these straws here could uh, represent a, a, a research specialty. So we see the world with incredible detail, but through these straws. That is very much uh, uh, like the way uh, we put together our picture of the world. However, there's also another way to look at things, and that involves different kinds of brain functions, which is taking in the big picture all at once. But of course, we tend to get a very low resolution. Uh, of what we're looking at. So can you make out what that picture may be? Well, probably not. So here it is. So if our brains are designed to simultaneously connect the dots and see the big picture, are we biased in favor of apprehending the world through straws? And I thought I'd just make brief mention of uh, the work of Ian McGilchrist, because it's just, it's quite extraordinary. He's a psychiatrist and uh, a, a researcher in the cognitive neuroscience. And I think he's presented a, a work of tremendous scholarship, which may be seen in the future as a groundbreaking look at how we are, we are literally thinking with our brains he asked the question, why do animal brains have two different but complementary hemispheres? We essentially have two, two brains in our heads, right? All animals do this, have this feature. And uh, I tried to summarize the complexity of his work. And sometimes I feel it's easier to do it in my own words, but I may, I may be misrepresenting him. But his essential thesis is that... Uh, he asks, has our amazing success with tool making, with rules, with procedures, technology, individualism, and reductionist thinking caused us to somehow favor the less left hemisphere strengths of categorization and what he says is representation, taking the big picture and then look, breaking it up into categories, giving names to those categories, organizing those categories, we're exceptionally good at that. So the whole, in other words, the whole is the sum of the parts. But are we doing that to the detriment of right hemisphere strengths, like understanding metaphor, holistic perception of the world, and the relationship amongst things, not just the things themselves? So in other words, uh, with the right hemisphere, we tend to see the whole as an emergent property of the com complex relationships among the parts. Very different ways of thinking. And normally we have these kinds of views in balance, but he's suggesting that uh, perhaps in the modern age, uh, our balance has shifted a bit too far to the left hemisphere. So I'll leave you with that. It's a very interesting thesis, but it does have a lot of bearing on how we think today. Okay. This is the ethical dilemma the Anthropocene prevent, uh, presents us to. How can we live a good life with these swords of Damocles dangling over us? We're living every day now with the thought of collapse, potential collapse of everything. And we don't even know what that looks like, really. It's a great feat of imagination to try to imagine the unimaginable.
Okay, let's start with some definitions here so we can proceed. There's a founding assumption here. The quality of our lives is contingent upon the quality of our reasoning. So if you don't accept that assumption, I guess, well, you know, you could probably beg out early on this uh, presentation, but I think it's seminal to what we're trying to do here. Uh, critical thinking. I just define critical thinking myself as a cognitive toolkit for how to think about thinking, well, especially while we think, to improve our thinking. Critical thinking is the toolkit, and all the tools I give you will fit in that type of toolkit. Uh, and we have to remind ourselves a tool is a thing used to perform a task and extend the capabilities of our bodies and minds we use a lot of cognitive prostheses in humans, mathematics, writing. Imagine we can extend our senses, our, uh, we can extend what we say into the future infinitely, as was just mentioned a while ago. It, it's extraordinary what we've done with our thinking to extend it, just as uh, the James Webb uh, telescope extends our vision. Okay, ju our judgment, of course, is, is an important concept here because I'm, all, I'm talking about thinking that requires judgment. I'm not talking about the kind of thinking that answers a, a factual question like the boiling point of water at sea level. And I'm not talking about thinking when it comes to personal preference. We can't really argue with that. If you like this kind of beer, well, you like it. It's not right or wrong. I'm talking about thinking that requires judgment across many uh, systems. And uh, thinking, of course, it's very difficult to define thinking, you know? It's, it's in essence, it's how we create the world. Uh, we perceive the world, perceive changes, solve problems, make predictions, plan, learn, feel emotion, et cetera, et cetera. And as I said, we, employ these cognitive prostheses, which are particularly effective in our evolution, but often come back to haunt us. See, there's no free lunch when it comes to our evolving minds. You know, we tend to think there is, but oof, they can get us into such trouble. Okay, uh, and again, just reminding you for the, the purposes of this talk, thinking, reasoning, and cognition are all words describing the same process. And uh, we will talk about wisdom too. That's kind of the end goal of philosophy. And you'll notice a lot of philosophy in this talk. I just call wisdom your mental database of objective knowledge and experience, hyperlinked like the World Wide Web to values, ethics, social, and survival skills. Now, this last uh, definition is very important because I'll insist that you pay attention to this uh, when you ask your questions. A formal argument in philosophy is a conclusion supported by one or more valid premises. Now, a stated claim, assertion, or opinion is really not an argument. It's just a free-floating uh, claim um, unattached to evidence or logical backup. So I would uh, suggest that we try to avoid just making uh, un, uh, ungrounded claims in this. A formal argument is a much easier thing to discuss. Okay, here I just run through a formal argument for this talk and all I, I won't go through the whole thing, but whenever you have a premise, you can usually, if you stick the word because in front of it, that works. Because the quality of our lives depends on the quality of our thinking, because, 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 therefore, the conclusion is, we must improve our thinking skills commensurate with the unique challenges of the Anthropocene. So that's a formal argument to this talk. I certainly don't use the word argument in the sense of a, an emotionally charged exchange with people. Nothing, that's not what we mean in philosophy, so. Okay, uh, now we are on to some of the daunting uh, cognitive challenges of the Anthropocene. And I'm quoting from this delightful little book uh, by Cordelia Fine, A Mind of Its Own, uh, from 2006. It was one of the first of that genre that, uh, from uh, psychology, essentially, 
that uh, basically told us our mind uh, operates in very counterintuitive ways. I love the way she phrases this. To begin with, your mind is infatuated with itself. Of course. In addition to being utterly brilliant, it is unscrupulous, pig-headed, vain, secretive, emotional, weak-willed, immoral, bigoted, et cetera, et cetera. Well, all, about all I can say is suck it up, human. Do your best. <laughs> So we can all uh, empathize with this fellow. How often have we said to ourselves, what was I thinking? But I prefer to phrase it in the sense of how was I thinking? I love the phrase train of thought. You, you know, there, it's amazing how many aphorisms uh, relate to our thinking. And I love the concept of train of thought. You know, no, no idea, no belief, uh, no assertion springs fully formed out of the ether. It's the result of a long, continuous train of thinking. And I have to ask here, I would like to ask Homer, when did your train of thought jump the tracks, man? Oh, I'd love to ask our leaders that question. Oh, and just as an aside, uh, something I picked up on Twitter, uh, the patron philosopher for the lazy thinker, mediocrities. I think he is uh, alive and well uh, in our nation. Meh, good enough. But if we can have optical illusions, why can't we have cognitive illusions? Of course we do. If our perception can be fooled, of course I think it can be fooled. And all of you who have been to the Acropolis here in Athens know that in the Parthenon, there really isn't a straight line in the entire place. The Greeks were so, so aware of our visual perception uh, that they uh, created subtle, uh, subtle changes in the topology of the, of the Parthenon to make it as aesthetically appealing as possible. Sheer genius. Okay, we're talking about cognitive illusions now. This is the winner of the greatest co cognitive illusion of the Anthropocene, bar none. I, I thought there should be a big trophy, but I'm not sure who we could give it with, give it to. Using the energy of fossil fuels, continuous economic growth is both feasible and desirable. So uh, I uh, asked our artificial intelligence agent to talk about uh, what children think of our future. On the left here, that's in the style of Picasso. And it's so interesting that the, uh, the artificial intelligence mind has, has taken elements of Picasso's famous Guernica his a powerful painting of the, uh, the Spanish Civil War and adapted it for this. It's unbelievable. And the other picture is a really kind of a sad little picture of a child sitting there in front of a heap of, it looks like gowns, but in the middle, you notice there's, looks like an inflatable globe in there. It's extraordinary. But of course, this isn't the, the artificial mind here. He's taking He's synthesizing what our, our minds have thought about. Okay, now I'm going to read this. Oh, sorry. I'm going to read this whole uh, three paragraphs here because it's from a book by the psychiatrist Mark Rigo uh, called Frontal Fatigue. And it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant little book, you know? And uh, so he's talking about the way the prefrontal assault, of course, refers to the prefrontal cortex in our brain. That's really the executive control center, to put it simply. Uh, so he says, it's natural to think that we have, have it all figured out. We believe that we are no longer suffer under the misguided notions, superstitions, and prejudices that mislead our pre predecessors. Sorry. How could they believe such things, we wonder, and congratulate ourselves that we know better? While it's easy to fall victims to this cultural delusion, surely there are many things we fail to see today, blind spots that will astound our descendants. In a hundred years or so, will they look back and wonder, how could they have thought that? 
The prefrontal cortex has an amazing range of abilities, but has two major liabilities. One is that it does not work well, if at all, under stress. Second is that once stressed, any vulnerabilities to mental illness may then become active. It's just this process of stressing the prefrontal cortex by the relentless demands of modern life that places so many people either at risk of mental illness or actively suffering from a particular disorder. Powerful statements, and I cannot disagree with what he said. As a mental health professional all my life, I, this is what I, I see, I've seen on a daily basis. Okay, you want to know what some of the cognitive challenges are of the Anthropocene, and there is absolutely nothing in this that is an original thought on my part or nothing that's been, hasn't been said even a hundred years ago. But here we have it in, uh, in abundance. Okay, the things that really stress our brains out accelerate and change across multiple societal systems and dimensions. The rate of change is, seems exponential. How do we keep up? Demographics are changing in a high, highly mobile word, world. Our increasing ongoing separation from the natural world has major challenge, presents major challenges for us. And just having to think about the unimaginable, climate change and all the other problems today. Uh, it's, this is a huge brain on a uh, huge drain on our brains that did not really evolve for these purposes. The fact that whole generations believe they don't have a viable future, it to me is, is frightening, absolutely frightening. A great book to that uh, in, in that regard is Britt Ray's book, Generation Dread, which he addresses to younger people in, uh, in, in their, uh, their fear and loathing of uh, where society is headed. The theft of attention is a big one. We can't go anywhere without being assaulted by images, brands, messages, symbols. And uh, sophisticated media manipulates our emotions, perceptions, and beliefs. Uh, of course, we know about digital technologies. And I like the term hyper-normalization. I just started watching a film by Adam Curtis last night by that name. We're not just normalizing things like lying, fantasy, and other coping, other dysfunctional mechanisms in society. We know they're dysfunctional, so we have to go to an extraordinary length to try to normalize that. COVID is a beautiful example of that, if you, if you think about it. Well, lots of bright people have been thinking about thinking. In fact, that is probably what produces genius in the first place. And so you may be familiar with uh, Professor Feynman here. And he says in his pithy way, nature cannot be fooled, but you are the easiest person to fool. I'm not aware of any other species that actively engages in self-deception. Possibly crows, but I, I'm not, I can't, can't demonstrate that with any evidence. Also, you know, we have tremendous problems thinking about the climate crisis. Psychological defense mechanisms, denial, avoidance. We misapply the concept of reasonable doubt as well. Uh, when you think about it, science doesn't use reasonable doubt. Why would we give reasonable doubt to fossil fuel companies? And so forth. I'll, I think you realize, uh, I'll just skip over this because I think you realize uh, that we have a great dif difficulty thinking about the climate crisis because I don't think human beings have ever faced such a global calamity. And of course, we're seeing declining civility uh, and ad hominem arguments, which we'll talk about. What about ism? You know, uh, you ask a politician uh, or a, a, a fossil fuel executive, why do you pollute so much? And, uh, and then they'll ask you, well, what about so-and-so? What about the army? What about them? Don't they do it too? Well, everybody changes the topic on things. So, so uh, you get the feel of that. And I'll skip ahead uh, with those things. My opinion is as true as your facts. The death of expertise now is something that's troubled a lot of us for a long time. And I'll just read you what Isaac Asimov said in 1980. 
there is a cult of ignorance in the United, in the United States, and there always has been. The strain of anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural life, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. Ah, I think that kind of says it all. So now we're going to get to the next section here, as denoted by my questioning brain. Um, first of all, let's Let's come at this problem from the work of Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel uh, laureate psychologist who actually won the Nobel Prize for economics by essentially inventing the field of behavioral economics. Uh, we have a problem with our into, we have two basic systems. Don't think of these as modules at all. Uh, we have two basic systems in our brain intuition, which is the fast part of our thinking, effortless, hidden easy to fool. It's kind of a black box. Whereas reason is what we're really talking about here, our overt conscious process of thinking. It's hard work. It's slow. Uh, but it's more difficult to fuel, a fool. And it does create more uh, uh, better long term decisions. But we can be pretty lazy about that too. So the whole message here is that beware of intuition. It kind of bothers me when people always say, go with your gut, because intuitive thinking doesn't mean you're tapping into ESP or some, the force out there, a la Star Wars. Expert intuition must be trained, practiced, and evaluated. When a doctor, an emergency doctor, sees a patient coming in and they say, ah, I just sense, Something is amiss with this patient. I can't put my finger on it. That's expert intuition at work. It doesn't come out of the ether. And uh, I go through the advantages of this kind of uh, thinking. Uh, intuition often uh, is fast and, uh, and it uses very uh, efficient heuristics, informal rules of thumb that are part of our mental circuitry. But these are often hidden and implicit. Intu intuition is a shortcut to a quick decision, which is absolutely essential for survival. But in a complex world, don't trust it. Daniel Kahneman actually says that biases are systematic errors of intuition, which I think is a beautiful way to put it. And that's why I kind of like to call our Anthropocene brain Pandora's black box. We know a lot's going in there, but we, uh, going on in there, but we don't exactly know what it is. So, okay, here's some of the basics about when our intuition betrays us. I'm just going to run over a few of these things because I'm, I'm sure some of you, you're often aware of these things. There are a few more slides, but we'll just take care of a couple of them here. Confirmation bias. Yeah, we always tend to pay more attention to information that supports our beliefs while ignoring or downplaying just confirming evidence. You know, the fact is we all do this and we're not aware of it, but a good manager will make sure they take a look at disconfirming evidence. And uh, what are some of the others here? Overconfidence is a big one. We tend to be overconfident with respect to our own judgment and abilities as compared with others. Oh boy, groupthink, framing effects, the context in which information is presented can skew things tremendously. Misconceptions of chance. Just go to Wikipedia and look up cognitive bias. There are hundreds of them. The Dunning-Kruger effect is one of my favorites. People with low ability, expertise, or experience regarding a certain type of task or area of knowledge tend to overestimate their ability or knowledge. Oh boy, we see that all the time in social media. And interestingly, high performers tend to be, uh, tend to experience the opposite. And uh, let's go on to logical fallacies here. These are not errors of intuition now. These are errors of explicit reasoning. The good old straw man, politicians do this all the time. You dispute an argument by exaggerating it, misrepresenting it, or otherwise distorting it. By opposing limited wiretaps, Mr. Blah Blah, 
you are obviously arguing in favor of terrorism. Yeah, that's not what he said. But you put words in his mouth and then argue about that. So it's really dirty tactics. Misplacing the burden of proof is something people don't understand. Whoever makes a claim is responsible for providing the evidence for that. Prove I'm not a psychic. That doesn't really work. And so on, I'll skip ahead here, uh, the ad hominem argument, attacking the person. This is the most common one of all, disputing a position or argument by discrediting his source. You agree with global warming, but you drive a car, a big fancy car, you're a hypocrite. And you know, I've seen public figures fall for this. Ooh, me? Oh, gee, I better shut up. But it's simply a technique to get somebody to shut up, right? Call them a hypocrite, they'll shut up out of embarrassment. Similarly, the red herring, uh, the question asked was not the question answered. Are the tar sands safe for environment? And then you give the answer, but you need the oil, you drive a car. Similar to the other one I spoke of. Yeah, oh, and on and on we go. There are literally hundreds of logical fallacies. The appeal to popularity, it must be true because everybody believes it. Oh yeah, who is everybody anyway? I'd like to know what their expertise is. So, and uh, the final thing I'll talk about here, the final wrench in the works of our thinking is the social and situational dynamics that impinge upon us as members of a, a clan or a group. Um, we uh, are strongly affected by some very nasty situational cues uh, and uh, our behavior changes accordingly. Ask yourself, would you have worked for the Nazis in implementing the final solution? So, you know, other social and situational dynamics that bother me a lot is the question, why do we often choose mentally unwell leaders? How do we justify a decision? What collective illusions would inform our thinking? There's a very good book on that uh, by Todd Rose, I'd suggest. So there are all these nasty social and, uh, and uh, situational dynamics, de-individuation of outgroups, dehumanization, anonymity, propaganda, ideology, dogma, fear of rejection by one's peer group, role sanctioned by authority figures and the Lucifer effect, creative evil. Is evil called by, caused by bad apples or bad barrels? We all remember these dreadful pictures from Abu Ghraib prison. Okay, now we're just gonna uh, rush on here to a brief view of critical thinking and I'll expose you to a very quickly to a little critical thinking framework. I like this definition. Critical thinking is the awakening of the intellect to a study of itself from the late Richard, Dr. Richard Paul, who uh, founded the uh, Foundation for Critical Thinking. And it's all, a lot of thinking is really about doing philosophy. A philosophy prof once told me, look, philosophy isn't about studying what a bunch of dead old men said. It's what you can do to improve your life. How you do it in the real world is what counts. That's what Socrates was referring to in this very famous quote here. Christopher Hitchens, a great loss. The essence of the independent mind lies not in what it thinks, but in how it thinks. And the world we have created, as Albert Einstein said, is a product of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing our thinking. Okay, and just to quickly go uh, speak to this topic, people have a lot of misgivings about teaching critical thinking. The Texas legislature actually banned it because they thought that children might question their faith. There's a lot of pushback to teaching critical thinking. Anyway. Okay, here is a very quick model I'm going to, this is the core, a very simplified core of the framework for critical thinking that is taught to uh, kids, K-12 and uh, in graduate studies. 
it's very interesting at the conferences I've been to, I've met a lot of people from uh, military organizations around the world and intelligence organizations like the CIA. They take critical thinking very seriously and they use this framework in advanced training. So you essentially have elements of thinking, which is basically trying to understand what the heck you're arguing in the first place. What is the question you are asking? What is the uh, conclusion you're talking about? Let's narrow that down a bit before we get on with it. And then we apply intellectual standards to them. They're universal intellectual standards like clarity, precision, accuracy. Is this clear to me? Is what you're saying is, uh, you know, is you said your argument is about uh, um, defunding the police. Well, what exactly do you mean by that? Uh, and, uh, and so forth. So we'll get into that a little later. And kids are in encouraged to do, to think about developing central intellectual traits while, while they're doing their thinking, like intellectual humility, intellectual autonomy, which is thinking by yourself, not intellectual conformity. And we'll touch on these things here. Okay, the elements of thought. Now, unfortunately, the, we, we deserve a, a full workshop to do this kind of thing, but I just wanted to show you how simple and how intuitive, oop, I shouldn't have said that, but how rational this little framework is. This is taught to grade school students, and I've talked to some of those students, and they get it. Man, you know, Donald Trump could not get a word in past these kids. Honestly, this is so basic. You talk about, okay, you have a, you have, say you want to solve any question. Okay, what's the purpose of your question, sir? What is the real question at, an, uh, at, at hand? What's the problem? What's the real issue? What information do you have uh, to back that up? What's your evidence, observations? How are you interpreting this information? What concepts are you using here? We often use concepts uh, the wrong way and uh, that uh, those mistakes become hidden. What assumptions are you making? Oh my goodness, that's a big one. We often don't ask people uh, when they present their argument, well, what are the implications of, and consequences of what you're saying here? If you want to defund the police, what are the implications of that? And you really want to understand somebody's point of view. Because if someone's a policeman, they're going to have a very different point of view than, say, uh, a sexual assault uh, therapist. The therapist, their worldview says, help the patient first, help the patient heal. The cop's worldview says, get the perpetrator off the street so he doesn't do any, uh, any more harm. Those are both valid statements, but I've seen both parties argue over this and it's just their world, their point of view. Now here are the universal intellectual standards that we wanna take a look at. Okay, and I'm noticing my time folks, don't worry, uh, we'll get through this. Intellectual, universal uh, intellectual standards are not the same as saying, well, of course I have standards that I apply to all reasoning, I'm a scientist. Well, no, you, you, you definitely have uh, uh, scientific standards to follow, but these are meant to be applied to all forms of reasoning that involves judgment. Clarity is the gatekeeper standard, right? If you don't understand what somebody is saying, uh, you can't proceed. Could you elaborate further? Could you give me an example? Could you illustrate what you mean? Accuracy is very important too. You could easily say all dogs uh, weigh more than uh, 10 grams. Well, you know, not very accurate. And likewise, uh, not very precise either. Sometimes you need more detail. I always like to ask too, how is your statement relevant to the topic here? How does this, your statement relate to the problem? Because quite often you can head off silly arguments in the past uh, just by asking them, well, how is this relevant to uh, this discussion? Depth, of course, you understand. It, often you need a lot of depth talking about the Anthropocene because there are multiple interacting problems. And likewise, breadth, logic, does everything hang together? Significance, 
you know, yeah, what you say is true, sir, but how, oops, how significant is that to us? And of course, fairness or fair-mindedness is something we should always, that's a standard we should always apply. You know, are, do you have vested interests in this issue? Are you uh, fairly representing all viewpoints? So, you know, you go around your little circle and then you apply uh, universal intellectual standards to see if your reasoning makes sense. And out of this comes a much deeper uh, foundation for understanding your thinking and being able to find out where you make errors in that thinking. And then finally, we come to the essential intellectual traits that I wish every young person could take to heart, especially the first one here. Who couldn't benefit from more intellectual humility? which is really acknowledging that there are always limitations to our thinking, limits to our knowledge. We, are, we all have our biases. We have to be very humble about our thinking and realize, yeah, this takes a lot of work. But unfortunately, we see too much intellectual arrogance in the world and uh, we know where that leads. Intellectual courage versus intellectual cowardice. Intellectual empathy. Now, this is an important one. This is understanding what it's like to hold that view through a person's eyes. It's a little different than emotional empathy, being in their shoes. But this is extremely important. What is it like to hold a conspiracy theory? How does a person, uh, how does that affect someone's life? And of course, intellectual autonomy, thinking for yourself, as opposed to intellectual conformity. So. There you have, in a nutshell, inside of a few minutes, I've described an entire critical thinking framework. Very superficially, but those are the elements. Okay, and I, I urge you to take a provision, to be a good skeptic. Skepticism is an intellectual stance towards claims that take provisional approaches to all claims, demands compelling evidence before a claim is accepted, does not defer to dogma, is embodied in the scientific method. And it's not about being a cynical old debunker like me. Spinoza said, had something very nice to say about that. I've made a ceaseless effort not to ridicule, not to bewail, not to scorn human actions, but to understand them. That Spinoza was a 17th, 18th century philosopher in uh, Holland and a brilliant thinker. Uh, you know, centuries before his time, Baruch Spinoza. He was a, a Jew that uh, didn't believe, believe in Jew Judaism. So you can imagine the time he, <laughs> he had in Holland. So, and I remind you to ask good questions, but you know, I'm going to skip ahead. Well, I like this about asking good questions. This, this is the wrong approach, folks. We all know this question about God, but yeah, it's, uh, there are good ways and lesser good ways to uh, pursue your thinking. So I'm gonna literally skip over those uh, thinker tips because they're a bit super superfluous. And to me, I just think, one of, my last tip was pay attention to good thinkers. Try to understand why they are good thinkers and watch them in action. Read what their arguments are. Look at their train of thought and how they string arguments together. And I have to say Greta Thunberg is utterly brilliant when it comes to crafting simple arguments. She just seems utterly, uh, utterly bereft of, uh, uh, of arrogance and uh, presumptiveness. You know, she really models intellectual integrity for me. Okay, just to finish off here, I put in the, uh, the text string, hungry children dreaming of a beautiful future. And this is my token good news for people here. You always have to do that in presentations I hear. Always has to be, is there hope? Well, this is, this is what the AI problem generated for me. I think they're absolutely beautiful. Look at, look at the, these pictures. 
what a beautiful depiction of hope that these hungry children are looking up at. And these little faces here, look at the little furrow in the brow. I, this is extraordinary. So if, uh, if a computer can uh, think as well as this, surely we can do a better job. Okay, reason is our candle in the darkness, folks. Please nourish its precious flame. And of course, that comes from Carl Sagan and his utterly brilliant book, uh, A Demon Haunted World. So there we go. Here's discussion. And I love this little cartoon. It's a very philosophical question here. Okay, well, I will hand things over now to the discussion. Thanks very much, Garth. You. Uh... Finished well within your time there. So um, I got a question maybe before I open it up here. Um, mm -hmm. Earlier in your talk, you said judgment can be described as a measurement yes. where the instrument is a human mind. How can you elaborate on that and, and how is that relevant to your topic? Um, yes, good question here. That was a direct quote from uh, Daniel Kahneman from his book, uh, sorry, I did skip over that pretty quickly, but uh, he has written his latest book, uh, he is co-authored and it's called Noise. It actually talks about another very fascinating phenomenon in our minds, which is simply noise. And you all know what noise is in science, what noise represents, it's, uh, it's just random interference. And it, as it turns out from all of his uh, research, uh, he has found how noise impacts our thinking tremendously. And, and you know, and uh, just uh, the most obvious example is the distractions of society. Looking, look at how all of the images that we're bombarded with, uh, all the uh, taglines, the messages, the invocations uh, to uh, appeals to purchase, you know, all of those things can represent a lot of random noise that really interferes with the strength of our thinking, the strength of our signal. So that's what he was referring to. And uh, I certainly recommend you uh, read his book, the references in the presentation here. Does that, uh, is that good, Jeff? Does that help? Yes, I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So John Legg, you had the first question. Would you like to? State it yourself, or should I read it? And you need to unmute. John, are you there? Okay, we'll go to the next one. I'll come back to John. Uh, Dave, you asked a couple of questions, but I think at one point you said my first question was asked. Do you want to tackle your other one, or both, for that matter? Sure. Um, well, I did see, uh, Garth, that you mentioned the Dunning-Kruger effect, um, mm -hmm. and and I think also that you mentioned um, cognitive dissonance, but perhaps I could ask you to say a few words uh, about that, essentially knowing that something is wrong, but doing it anyway, and I was wondering if you have seen something called the Cranky Uncle. It's a website. It was written by... Um, Dr. John Cook, who's a, a research fellow at Monash, Monash University mm -hmm. and uh, the originator of the Skeptical Science website, which is an excellent mm -hmm. website. If people haven't seen it, they sh certainly should mm -hmm. try to spend a few minutes there every once in a while. So mm -hmm. uh, a couple of words about uh, cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. and uh, a couple about the cranky uncle, if you wouldn't mind. Mm -hmm. Great question. Uh, yes, I believe is the cranky uncle site about how we could have better arguments with uh, people who believe weird things. <laughs> it's uh, really concentrating on climate change. Yeah, yeah. Um, but arguably, uh, what he points out could be taken to virtually any scientific controversy. Mm, there are not always uh, mm. actual scientific controversies. There are things over which p people are trying to create comfort controversy yes, exactly. and, yes, and I, he ex I, yeah he explores the the usual suspects of uh, mm -hmm. um, approaches that they make mm -hmm. 
Yes, I have been to that site, in fact, and uh, and and I thought it was very useful as well for uh, people, Americans talking around the Thanksgiving table with the cranky uncle who's a Trump supporter and everyone else isn't. But it's it is a wonderful site, as I, I remember seeing it a number of months ago. So thanks for reminding people about that. Cognitive dissonance, oh, a huge topic in psychology. I believe the term now I, I have I can't remember the name. Uh, was it Feisinger or I can't remember the name of the uh, uh, the psychologist that coined the term, but cognitive dissonance is this tremendous pressure in our brains where uh, something in the world or some concept we have in our brains uh, is in conflict with another reality. So in other words, a cognitive one of the best examples of cognitive dissonance, is uh, people in the Western world. Here we are in Canada. We, we uh, per capita, uh, we uh, produce more greenhouse gases than virtually any other country in the world. We're pretty much tied with Saudi Arabia and we're in that group. So we think to ourselves, yeah, geez, that feels really guilty. And yet I have this image and we're told by our prime minister that we're leaders in climate change. Now, there's a conflict in there in your brain that cannot really be resolved. And if you don't bring cognitive dissonance out from your intuition into your rational faculties and examine that, it can, it can uh, have some very damaging effects to your psyche. And cognitive dissonance, does, I think, does precipitate or at least uh, help to uh, help to uh, increase uh, mental unwellness sometimes because you have these tremendous unresolved uh, conflicts. The same thing is like working for a company that uh, does something immoral. You need the money, you need to support your kids, you need that money, mm -hmm. but at the same time you're doing something utterly immoral against your principles. That is really hard in our brains. Is, uh, so is that, does that uh, help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, if you're, you're done, are you, Dave? Um, okay, uh, come back to John Leg here. You had uh, your question. Thank you very much uh, uh, to, to put up with my delay. <clears throat> my, uh, it, it, let's put it this way. Garth, do you agree? As, as part of how we can improve our thinking about the issues of, of the Anthropocene, that getting rid of issues in advance, uh, those ones which are not really important problems. And mm -hmm. I, I, I just raise one example, mm -hmm. and that is how the United Nations works or doesn't work. Uh, and from what I, and I admit that I did not just uh, study this, but from what I can see, the conference of the parties uh, mm. way of operating, it seems to operate on a consensus method. It doesn't get into the unfairness of the Security Council structure and things like that. And uh, you, we all may have seen where the chair says, I, since I see no objections, the proposal is therefore adopted. And mm -hmm. of course, behind all that mm -hmm. is, a, is a sort of a history of how things went uh, on the spot. So mm -hmm. I guess perhaps it's a, anyway, if you have any comments about how not to get hung up on the old problems, when in fact, we can just live with them, such as the UN structure. I don't think the conference of the parties, and I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that's how we should do it in the future, but I don't think they get into really the UN structure at all. Mm -hmm. Well, what, John, thank you very much. That's an excellent, <laughs> very complex and comprehensive question. And just to let people know, uh, look how well uh, John asked that question. He immediately clarified what he meant by giving an example. You know, that is just what we want to do. 
But of course, this is the audience and I'm grateful for you folks. But anyway, John, yeah, to parse your question a bit. Yeah, first of all, I, I guess, would it be fair to say uh, one part of your question was asking how we can prioritize things uh, in, uh, in doing this, presumably because there are just so many problems that uh, that uh, s seem to bury us like uh, like a collapsing garbage heap, <laughs> and it's and again it may be in in some ways that uh, accounts for our our theft of attention. Our attention is constantly being pulled between these yeah. consequential issues, and there are dozens of consequential issues. How do, in the world do we prioritize those things in our minds? Well, you know, it's it's a difficult to answer that question. I know, first of all, that uh, there are many good frameworks, and this is where good thinking come, comes along. And there are ways, frameworks, of prioritizing issues in business. You can, uh, you know, you can set up a spreadsheet with all kinds of uh, at attributes that an issue has to check off, and then you, in terms of importance, but, you know, that's generally not what we do. I think, you know, in society, unfortunately, we have no uh, single uh, universal voice for telling us what the priorities are. You know, people in, in a complex society, it really seems that everyone's self-interest or group self-interest dictate what priorities they wish to focus on. So it makes it very difficult. And uh, when it comes to a body like uh, like uh, a, the uh, the folks organizing the conference of parties, you can imagine the tremendous difficulty they have in pulling in all of these disparate organizations, all of so many of whom have mutually conflicting goals and priorities. Somehow they have to try to try to make sense of this. But you know, I, I honestly, I don't think there's any easy way of a complex society getting on the same wavelength about what their priorities are. You know, where does one start? I think one thing we can do ourselves is simply to uh, get used to overloading our brains. What I like to do, here's a little heuristic. I like to just start with a clean mind and write down a list of a certain category of problems. Like the other day, for example, I decided to write down a list of uh, cognitive illusions of people. Well, just off the top of my head, you know, I went down a list and there were like three pages of cognitive illusions, uh -huh. you know, and, uh, and, and I, but I think the, uh, the biggest problem is, uh, and this is a point that Adam Curtis made in the film I started watching last night, hypernormalization. He says, the problem with society, one of the problems with society did today is that we're well aware of all of the problems. We, for example, we know politicians lie and politicians know that we know they lie, but they still lie. And he says, the, the trouble is we're stuck because no one in the political spectrum, left or right, has provided a viable alternative for a new type of society. And when you think about it, we really don't have any ideas for building a new world that takes into account into solving all of these complex problems, right? Yep. So we're really in this na nasty interregnum of knowing we need change, but we lack the imagination for it. So one uh, remedy for that is just starting on our own and push our imaginations. How do we, how do we think outside the box? But of course, I like to say, uh, I like to ask, what is the box? There's no box, you know, but I think using, even using science fiction to inform our thinking can really help us. That's, you know, uh, credible science fiction. Uh, well, I should say hard science fiction, not fantasy, but anything can help uh, uh, getting us thinking about what the real priorities are. And that's about the best answer I can give you, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. It's, it's a big question that deserves a lot of thinking. Prioritization. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, uh, Garth. Uh, Jean Doherty asked an excellent question. I'm going to let her restate it for you. Mm -hmm. um, 
Garth, thank you so much for a really, really interesting presentation. You've touched on a lot of things that have really bothered me over the last while. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the essence of my question was um, or is, do you think that social media has had a, what effect does social media have on all of the things you're talking about, especially with respect to our young people? And I would add, if you could comment on whether or not you think that it has contributed to this um, explosion of mental health issues that we are starting to see in our world. If you could uh, address that a little bit, please. Thank you. Oh, what an excellent, excellent question. Uh, you know, that I'm sure that's troubled a lot of us here. I think, think we'll find we're all kindred spirits in a lot of this thinking. And I appreciate uh, your question from that standpoint too. Well, social media, oh my God, I, I'm, I have a lot of cognitive dissonance over this because I, I didn't necessarily mention it in my biography, but believe it or not, I took a decade out of healthcare and worked uh, in telecom, telecommunications, and uh, just about the first project I got that no one else wanted to was starting internet services for TELUS. At that time, it was uh, two companies, Alberta Government Telephones and uh, EdTel in Edmonton, but they merged during my project, which was another uh, little challenge. But, uh, but yeah, I'm one of the godfathers of social media. And I have to say, we anticipated some of the problems, but we could never have, never have anticipated how, what, what happened to it. And social media is probably one of the greatest stressors for our brains in all our senses. A uh, lot of good stuff has been written on this, specifically about uh, um, kids and social media. I would recommend the book by Jean Twenge. If you've read, I think that's how you pronounce her name. It's spelled like Twenge, T-W-E-N-G-E. -E. She's a psychologist from uh, California, I believe. And she wrote a book, iGen. And what she does is she uh, references all of the longitudinal statistics uh, about child, child, child's mental health, uh, child and adolescent mental health that go back uh, right to the 40, 1940s. And she talks about the dramatic changes in these, I guess you could say millennials, the first generation that grew up with an iPhone that has always known social media and the iPhone. And there are some profound impacts on those, uh, on those kids that she attributes to uh, social media. And of course, the, the first one we've, first of all, the research shows very clearly that pe the use of social media and the prevalence of anxiety and depression are, are correlated pretty strongly. Uh, it, and so much of that is due to, of course, all the peer pressures. Now, poor adolescents, they're busy trying to figure out their peer group anyway, figure out who they are in society, what, what their role will be. Uh, and, and that's hard enough face to face. But how? But now they have to do it online with a lot of people they don't even know. A lot of people who are, who are only there for the sport of upsetting kids, as we know. And so uh, this is really, like we said at the beginning of the internet, this is a huge experiment, and we will never see the resol uh, resolution of this experiment. This is a, again. This is a. This represents a, a, a cognitive prosthesis that we've invented for the human mind that gives us the power of the world in the palm of our hand. It's extraordinary. It, if you wanted to define information overload and emotional overload, that's what it is. And we just don't know where this is going, but I think uh, this, the, there's ample evidence to show that first of all, this has really affected kids' socialization. It's affected their attention span. It's affected their reading, you know. Uh, it's it's affected their be, their behavior in a negative way in terms of going out and seeing their friends. They're not having face to face interactions to the extent that just the previous generation did. They are a real outlier, just like the Anthropocene is an outlier for human behavior. So that that's such an excellent question, and, and oh, we could go on uh, for an hour discussing this, and it's it's. 
Well, just referring back to John's question about uh, priorities. I mean, this is the this is these are the people that are going to try to save the human race for heaven's sakes. And what are we doing to make that easier for them? Yeah. Oh my goodness, it's just heartbreaking, like generation dread. There are so many kids, and I've talked to them directly, adolescents. There are so many kids that say, I don't have a future. I'm not going to have children. You killed my future. You know, in fact, uh, my uh, speaking to my nephew, he said, well, we don't even talk about it anymore with my friends. We all know it's like a, sh quote, shit, and we're just going to get by. But how, you know, these are the people, this is our, the hope for the humanity. So we better take this seriously. So thank you so much for that question. And if you have any, any interesting references for that, uh, please send them over to me because it's a real issue as a mental health person. It's really close to my heart. I, I certainly don't have any references for it, but it's been mm -hmm. something that's been on my mind for a long time. And, and yes, it's particularly, particularly a problem for the younger generation who have not had the opportunity to develop their own critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But even for adults now who may have had some critical thinking skills, even they are being sucked into this social media and, mm. and getting into these silos where all you hear is the same stuff. And all you have to do is look at what happened. Well, what's the, the um, uh, what's going on now last year after the um, um, truckers convoy in mm. Ottawa mm -hmm. or uh, January 6th in the United States. And, and mm -hmm. that would never have happened if you didn't have social media. Precisely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it, it's just so, so profound. And I, I think all we can do on our part is make sure we talk to young people. Yeah, because what that's also done is it's created a real generational gulf, especially with with us boomers, and the youngest people we, I just find personally and speaking for myself anyway, and I didn't have kids, unfortunately, I regretted it, but the timing was bad, we got married too late. So, uh, we have to spend more time getting into their headspace, like intellectual empathy. What is it? What beliefs do young people have now? And what is it like to have those beliefs in their head, in their heads? And oh, I just think we could play such a major role at our age in terms of nurturing uh, young people, young climate activists. <clears throat> I laughingly suggested to Jeff that we become uh, human shields for young people. That's probably the best thing we can do, but, yeah. but I think we still have something to offer. So everybody, please, the, these are really good questions and just a lot of our thinking. Thank you. I would, I would also say mm -hmm. it would be well worth going back to our own youth when the fear Absolutely. of nuclear annihilation was something that Absolutely. we had to live with and had to learn how to deal with. It might be give us some clue as to how to to approach things for what's happening now. Anyway, oh, thank you so point. much, Mark. That was great. That was really great. Thank oh, well, you. Well, thank you so much. And you're so right. We we were young at that time. I was a bit of a protester, a hippie. I believed in all the same things I believe today. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we don't necessarily change that much. So thank you. Thank you. John Holland's there asked a more of a personal question to you or an appeal to Garth, but I'll let him uh, state it. Oh, sure. Uh, no, I'm out on parole. It's That's completely legit now. I don't want anybody thinking otherwise, so. Thank you uh, <laughs> from me as well. Uh, uh, Garth, you, you mentioned towards the end of your talk that you were grateful for we folk being here not as grateful as we are for you being there oh, so uh that's... thank you thank you for that um oh, thank you i have another thank you uh, i do the weekly quote on the kcor website and you okay. give me a small treasure trove thank you <laughs> oh okay my um, pleasure you you've been making uh, substantial contributions to the kcor climate blog mm. for for as long as, you, as you've been uh, with us. You've also served as a consultant in another, yes. other fields. Mm -hmm. Would you like to put your consultant's hat on and yes. suggest what you think we at KCOR, given our 100 members, $5,000 a year, we're not big spenders. We could become big spenders, but we haven't chosen to do that yet. Mm -hmm. What, 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 what 
suggestions, directions, approaches uh, would you suggest to those of us who, who, are, who are engaged in that? Oh my goodness. Well, thanks for putting me on the spot there, but thanks for all the kind comments. I, I, I always have in the back of my mind that I'm really just, my role is being a shit disturber to be crude about it. And I, I don't necessarily think, think well of everything I say, but, uh, but nevertheless, no, there's such a tremendous brain trust here. And in terms of what we should do in the organization, well, we're having these Friday meetings here which I think are kind of evolving into uh, kind of strategy sessions. But, uh, but I remember saying in the first meeting, uh, I just, we were just brainstorming and I came up with this tagline for us. What was it now? The, that KCOR is uh, the most experienced think tank for sustainability, you know, and what a brain trust we have. This is why I'm just so grateful to have found all of you, because as you all know, it's it can be a kind of a lonely world out there for people who think deeply about the issues that we think. And of course, you have the education to, uh, to, uh, to enrich the whole uh, conversation. So I, I don't, I, you know, that's a tough thing. I, I almost wonder if, if the best if you're talking about success as being influencing the real decision makers about uh, what we need to do uh, for sustainability, for a sustainable future, then perhaps our role is to be to position ourselves as senior consultants that have something unique to offer. We don't offer any particular dogma or our own uh, uh, trademarked framework that uh, management uh, consulting firms love to have. I, I admit I've done some of them myself, but, uh, but we have this ability to say, look, we have been around the block and we think deeply about these issues and we have valuable perspectives and we think decision makers should be listening to us because first of all, they're all probably younger than us, most of them <laughs> in Canadian government or whatever, or in business, but we just have this incredible wealth of experience and wisdom. I would say wisdom, you know, and, uh, and it, it's a shame uh, not to uh, put that to good use. But of course, as soon as one sets one up as an authority of anything, then you've got to be, we've got to be prepared for all the pot shots from uh, the people who simply want to destroy and uh, denigrate uh, the good things in the world. So we would have to, if we are uh, presenting ourselves as consultants, we'd have to be pretty clear about how we do that. But nevertheless, I think, uh, as I've said, one uh, lovely side project would be to put up um, an influence network in the sense that we write down every name of someone we have known or have access to who is either a primary decision maker or an influencer. And then we come up with a strategy where we can put our heads together and get the right audience. And then maybe just pretend we're, uh, you know, uh, five, $10,000 an hour consultants and go in there and uh, present uh, our ideas. So that's just, that's a brainstorm. But, but again, you know, we all, our time is valuable and whether or not that would make a difference, I don't know. But, but I think, yeah, just concentrating on this tremendous brain trust we have here. It's, I don't, there's nothing more valuable in the world than how we use this. And, and I'm so impressed with the expertise I see in KCOR uh, membership. Is that- I, a, a, a few years ago, uh, I was sort of in a selling mode for KCOR, very mm -hmm. modest. Mm -hmm. And one of the points I made uh, was that uh, there may only be 80 or 100 members, but it's quite unlike any other uh, learned society that I've been part of. And I was looking for somebody with a degree or with education in zoology. I had anthropology, mm -hmm. 
biology, all the way, not all the letters, but most of the letters. Mm -hmm. I, I should revise that list now because I can now write psychology. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. may be the most important part of all if you're trying to influence uh, somebody. So, uh, so thank you for that. And uh, uh, we, we, we are small, but uh, golly Moses, um, I've written a letter to my member of parliament about yes. the, the, the topic of the month. And, um, and, and uh, what she's, even if she understands, which is not likely, mm -hmm um she won't be in a position to influence the thinking of the prime minister which i think is crucial key in our mm -hmm. current uh, mm -hmm. society mm -hmm. um so would i be better off spending my time trying to reach students of various kinds uh we're in a i'm in a hell of a hurry one i'm old <laughs> And two, the, pr the problem which is on the top of my mind is progressing without cease. So would, mm. if, if, we were, if we came to choose between aiming for young people or aiming for decision makers, which way would you jump? Gee, what, what an interesting question now. That that uh, I'll have to give that a little thought. Well, uh, uh, you know, first come of all, come back was... again. Come and talk to us another day. Please come <laughs> back. <laughs> yes, well, I would just briefly say, uh, first of all, I, I guess we'd have to ask what the context is. It depends who the students are as well, because uh, all things being equal, you would prefer to inspire someone with the leadership attributes and the uh, the intellectual courage. To act to who who can go out there and make a difference, right? Uh, and and likewise, we have to pick our targets in uh, in politics too, because this is the thing. They're a bit of a black box, but all politicians do not follow the party line. You know, I've worked in politics a bit, and uh, behind the uh, public. Uh, uh, behind the public presentation, there are people who have many conflicting views, and I would love to know who in, among cabinet is the biggest uh, booster of uh, climate action now, and the most intellectually courageous, and then maybe choose that target as well. So, and so my answer is both are utterly important, but I guess maybe a deciding factor is the one you mentioned. You know, we're all we're all conscious of time here. <laughs> you know, you know, I'm uh, reasonably healthy at 68, but I do have some chronic problems, and who knows what the health system is going to be like. So I feel that sense of urgency too. So, so perhaps we could, uh, as long if we could find good targets in in any demographic, but particularly students, you know, who are have those real strong activist. Uh, uh, attributes, uh, you know, they would be a great place to start. And then you can uh, always, uh, if you if you can find out the right politician and the right place in, say, in cabinet, then you could try to get an introduction to them and uh, and so forth. And maybe using using the Club of Rome uh, brand, you know, to give a little more credibility for that. And uh, basically, whatever you say, it goes with me, John, anyway. So don't worry about <laughs> it. <laughs> but, thank yeah, you so, very much. Well, thank, thank you again for your kind words. And, uh, and I think we're all kindred spirits uh, around here, which is really amazing. I'm very grateful for that again. Thank you. Garth, with respect to your comment about... Uh, government and to some extent youth not really paying much attention to people with a lot of experience in that. Over the last 15 years, I've had the opportunity to visit oh, four or five um, First Nations schools. I don't mean residential schools. Mm -hmm. And every one of them set aside a room for elders. And there's always mm -hmm. one elder in there, at least. And, uh, and I know the students, uh, First Nations students, they do refer to them. Maybe we can take a, you know, a, a hint from that and set up something similar. I don't know. What a great comment. Yeah, I mean, okay, maybe we could add that to our uh, problems about the 
about at least Western culture, if not the entire Anthropocene, the yeah. uh, declining uh, respect for and uh, and uh, the declining respect for our elders. Life is, you know, we talk, there's a great book by an Oxford uh, psychologist. I may have referenced it in there. Not psychologist, a philosopher, an Oxford, a young Oxford prof in philosophy uh, who speaks to that issue quite uh, eloquently and, uh, and says that basically, um, oh, geez, I just lost my train of thought. There you go. I went off the tracks. What, uh, you, we were talking about elders and the point I was going to make is that we're so mired in short-termism uh, in our culture, as opposed to long-termism, which he advocates for, which virtually all uh, indigenous cultures practiced, thinking generations ahead. We don't even, we, we all, so much of our society thinks ahead to the, to the next uh, quarterly uh, uh, share prices, you know? We are incredibly short term. So that just leaves old people out, well, uh, uh, our elders as a superfluous. And look at the way we're treated in society now, increasingly housed, uh, for those who can't afford it, we're increasingly housed in these long-term care, well, warehouses, where we saw how badly people were treated. And we're not, we just don't value this, this expertise. Well, I think the only answer is we have to take it back. We just, it just means we have to act, be that much uh, more aggressive in promoting our wisdom and points of view. Uh, I have to get to a couple of questions that are still on the chat and then I'll come back to Claude and, and Phil who are sure. have their hand up. But um, Leon Festinger, he made a statement here. I don't know if he wanted to address it if he's here about his work on cognitive dissonance. That's right. That's the name, Fessner. I was, I was close. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. He's not there to comment further, I guess. Oh, Art. Um, Art Hunter, you, um, you had a question. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, this is kind of a naughty question, but, but oh, uh, <laughs> Donald Trump is not recognized as a critical thinker. Now, um, is he really just an actor on a stage playing to the audience and wearing a mask? Is he a critical thinker? How, how, how do you arrive at this conclusion? That is a very good question. And in fact, there is lots of clinical evidence about, uh, well, let's say his diagnosis. When Trump first uh, came to office, a group of psychologists and psychiatrists from the U.S., uh, led by uh, um, oh, her name has slipped my tongue. It'll come to me. They wrote a book called "The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump," and uh, even based on what I had seen from him, I I really labeled him as a, a narcissist and a psychopath. Those are personality disorders. Uh, nowadays, the real, the proper diagnosis would be an antisocial personality disorder. But people have, you know, the professionals have called Donald Trump uh, a malignant narcissist. That is a, a severe narcissistic personality. In other words, someone who has such a grandiose idea of themselves and their own ability that they sometimes lose touch with reality. But these people are not psychotic. Uh, they tend to uh, operate in boardrooms and uh, as heads of state. Because some, for some reason, we love these people. But that confidence in everything, I think, and his bravado is real. That emanates from his personality disorder of being a malignant narcissist. So I don't think there's any acting there at all. And I, I think there's lots of other evidence to indicate that he is not particularly bright uh, as we would define intelligence. He seems to have no sense of humor. He doesn't care for music. He doesn't read. So he, has, he uh, presents a lot of very concrete thinking to us. So it, it, just in my opinion, for what it's worth, I don't think he's acting. As many people have said, when he tells us he's going to do something like his revenge tour of running for president again, 
you have to take that seriously because often uh, malignant narcissists tell us exactly what they're going to do. So there's no subtlety to his brain at all. And I think he's the antithesis of the critical thinker. He's, uh, he is the most uh, egocentric thinker I could, I could ever imagine. And if he, I always thought, what would happen if he came into Psych Emerge when I was back there in the 80s, you know, as a, as a 20 something kid dealing with people, if, if I interviewed him, I would say, there's, there's no hope for this man. These people do not do well at all in therapy. Because first of all, they don't believe they need it. They be, they're so grandiose, and extravagant in their thinking, uh, and, and, and so vengeful for anybody that crosses them, that I would say, forget it. Don't, please don't come back. We can't help you here, you know? So unfortunately, most psychopaths and narcissists are not, not e utterly evil, creatively evil people but they can leave a wake of human destruction behind them. So, so that's, yes, he's, he's not a critical thinker. He's a very seriously mentally unwell human being. Thank you. Okay, Craig McNaughton has um, a comment on there. I don't know if he wants to address it other than what's in the... Craig, are you there? Guess not. So, in which case, Peter McKinnon has a question. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> yes, thank you, uh, Garth, for uh, pardon me. I have a lot of enjoyed this. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, oh, my, question, my question touches on a much broader topic that I didn't hear the word specifically, but I think was wrapped all through your presentation. And so, what I wrote in the chat is. What about the breakdown in trust, integrity, truth, and ethics, especially related to young people and their sources of information? Hmm. Uh, so you're asking uh, these questions specific to young people and how their trust of institutions. Well, I say especially. I say especially young people because we've been talking especially about the people. differentiation between the gray hairs and the young people recently in the yeah. last few minutes. <laughs> But in general, of course, I'm interested sure. in general, but the young people are ones who are going to make the decisions, as was being pointed out, uh, mm. developing this argument. Uh, what, what a big question. And uh, actually, I, I was planning to do uh, the, uh, a more uh, ethics focused presentation here, but I decided just to throw in the little module of critical thinking because ethics is very close to my heart here. And yeah, there's. This is hard, hard to look at. We, we all, we know there's been a tremendous breakdown in trust, but it's, it's hard to know what the baseline is. Uh, we tend to think, sure, we don't trust politicians, but we've never trusted politicians. It's always been this way. Or there's never been trust between young generations and older generations. But I, I don't think that's that's true. I think that just because of the normal one reason, the normalization of of self interest, shameless self interest, and lying and manipulation and fantasy uh, has gone a long way to uh, destroy the fabric of trust throughout society. You know, we've this is hyper normalization of lying is is really extraordinary. Because remember when Trump first came on the scene, we couldn't believe our ears. He was just lying, lie after lie after lie. And it was so extreme. And it really barely a year after we had him with us as president, we were beginning coming to accept those lies. And when an authority figure does it, it's that much easier for people to emulate that behavior or get permission for someone like that to lie. Even when you think about it, even our legal system is, is set up now to lie. I know everybody deserves a good defense, but now lawyers are so good that the side that is lying often wins because they, there's a, the whole art of jury, uh, jury selection and manipulation. And it's just shameless manipulation and, uh, and <clears throat> people normalize that. So when you normalize ethical outrages, then, uh, Trust, the trust of thinking people breaks down. 
and perhaps even I would say perhaps the uh, the far right revolution, as we could call it, uh, the call it proto fascist, neo fascist, whatever, is almost predicated on a lack of trust. But we they say we simply we don't trust the people we don't like. If they're not, we trust uh, unconditionally. We trust people in our in-group, but we do not trust people that we don't like that are different than us, that are easy scapegoats. And we trust, implicitly trust the politicians we like, and yet we the politicians that are in the wrong party are simply labeled as uh, completely trustworthy and deplorable. So. So in that climate, what do, you know, I keep thinking, what are our, what do our young people think of this? And I've asked them about it, and so many young people are just horrified by what what adults are doing. And and I keep thinking back, you know, the first time that you realized when you were a kid that your parents were fallible. You know, it's an interesting thought. Uh, I know people have written about this. And we, we do trust our parents so much, we depend on them as children, but there's always that time when we realize they're fallible human beings like the rest of us. And that's kind of a shock. But now it seems so many young people just accept the fact that all of society is highly fall fallible and because of that, they're untrustworthy. So I think we're really in a cul-de-sac here with our thinking. Building back, as the old saying goes, trust is like a bank account you keep contributing to. It takes a long time to build up trust, but it takes almost no time to destroy that trust. Somebody comes along and just empties your bank account, then you just don't get it back very easily. So we really are in, in a conundrum here. And I think... Uh, yeah, I, I uh, again, I think one of the best ways to uh, to achieve some trust is simply to rely on the one thing we can have in common, the one common reality to us, which is objective reality, the reality that you can measure, you can see the reality of science and the reality of logic, too. And if we can concentrate on that with our thinking and discuss our issues with young people, so that they that it becomes clear what we're agreeing on, then that can build up some trust too. Does does that help? I know it's a very tough question. Well, I know it, it's a very big issue, um, but I'm also wondering um, where leadership comes in here because mm. young people, if we talked about young people, uh, they look to something. They look to someone. In our society, we've had civics in the past, certainly. Mm -hmm. as, Mm -hmm. You know, baby boomers, we were all probably involved in some kind of civics organization. Mm -hmm. Today, they're disappearing. Yeah. Um, you know, even the religious side where there might be so-called a religious person who can be a mentor or mm -hmm. an ear, that's disappearing because people aren't mm -hmm. going to religious centers. So uh, where Peter, is the leadership? I, I have to interrupt here. Um, and Gareth, that we're past an hour and 35 minutes, so uh, okay. we can answer these other things, I think, off offline. Um, I'm supposed to pass mm -hmm. over to Gene Doherty here now to, to uh, end it. Oh, OK. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. I'd, I'd be happy to engage in, well, we can all engage in discussion of these issues as we do. And remember all the expressions about thinking. Two heads are better than one. A stitch in time saves nine. Just think about all the aphorisms that deal with thinking. Our ancestors knew all about critical thinking. I'm sorry. I think we've forgotten a lot. Anyway, thank you. That's my final word. What a, what a wonderful way to end it, Garth. And, <laughs> and it is indeed my pleasure and privilege to uh, thank you on behalf of the Canadian Association for the Club of Rome. Uh, you have given a very, I use the term, thoughtful presentation <laughs> and one that I think is going to create and generate a lot of discussion amongst our people because you've you've touched on so many topics that are near and dear to our hearts I think it, it was just absolutely wonderful thank you very very much for oh for well thank you so much for those kind words thank you I uh, I do feel pretty humble in this this crowd so thank you all so much That's, so, uh, this will be an ongoing ongoing 
conversation, I hope. Excellent, excellent. And I would also like to say for those of you who are still online and uh, listening to this later, I would strongly um, ask you to please go to our website, CanadianCore.com. There you can, if you sign up for the Stay Informed, you will be getting all the information of all the new releases that are happening, our newsletter that is happening with our organization and you will be given uh, links to this particular talk and all of the various videos that we have up on our YouTube, the discussions and, and presentations that we've had are absolutely wonderful. And um, also I would ask that anybody who is here, if you could uh, become a member of KCOR so that you can be involved in some of these other discussions that you guys have been alluding to. There are some active uh, discussion groups that we have and to get access to those you need to be a member. So if you're interested in becoming a member of KCOR, please go to our website, fill in a form for membership. And I, I really ask that you do that. It's wonderful um, to, to have access to the, all these great thinkers, as you say. So again, thank you very much, everybody for coming today. And we'll see you next week.